Good morning, afternoon, and evening to you, depending on the time of day you're listening to and or watching this audio visual training on the fabulous topic of carbohydrates. Welcome back to Fitness Empowerment by Danny, a brand dedicated to flexible nutrition, macronutrient tracking, and a lifestyle without unhealthy extremes. So welcome back to my channel and this video, and if you've been here before the past couple of weeks and you've listened to the past few audio trainings, then you know that we've spoken about two other major macronutrient groups, fats and protein. If you haven't listened to those, then I highly suggest you go listen to them after this. Um, but now it is time to give some spotlight to carbohydrates. So go ahead, pause the video, grab a piece of paper and a writing utensil, or your computer for note taking if you have not done so already. There are quite a few aspects of carbohydrates that we will discuss today to include things like what are carbohydrates? What are the different types of carbohydrates? The differences between them? Processed versus natural? Simple versus complex and starchy versus fibrous versus sugars? As well as calorie dense versus nutrient dense? and um, you know what's good versus bad. So, and a lot of those things overlap, which you will see. So it, it's gonna be pretty interesting. I mean, I love food, and I think the more that I understand it, the more that I even wanna learn. So hopefully the same holds true for you guys. Um, let's start with the basics. So what are carbohydrates? Carbohydrates are your body's preferred form of energy and fuel, especially when it comes to building lean muscle mass and burning fat in your workouts. With the exception of a ketogenic lifestyle that uses fats as its main fuel source, a majority of other diets and lifestyles focus on utilizing carbohydrates optimally for attaining the lean and toned physique that many of us are after. While fats are a fuel source, they do not burn as efficiently as carbohydrates. So you've heard me say this before and I'm saying it again, fats are nine calories per gram while carbohydrates are four calories per gram. Simply put, it takes less energy to burn one gram of carbohydrates than it does one gram of fat. While cutting carbohydrates out of your diet is an effective method for fat loss when done appropriately, research and practical application or trial and error has shown us that approximately 100 to 130 grams of glucose per day are necessary for our brains to function and optimally um, perform physically. So 100 to 130 grams of carbs per day. Um, again, this is with the exception to the ketogenic lifestyle and when in ketosis, your brain switches from using glucose as its main um, energy fuel source to using ketones. Um, and that's a whole nother story. But <laughs> fat is a backup fuel when carbohydrates are either not available or when your level and intensity of exercise changes. Allow me to explain. So your body's constantly burning a combination of fats and carbs, right? Well, at a lower intensity or during non-exercise phases of your day, like NEAT training or non-exercise activity thermogenesis, your body will burn a higher percentage of fat grams, and the higher the intensity goes, the more the percentage, um, the levels change to burning a higher percentage of carbohydrate calories. This being said, you might be wondering, so if we wanna burn more fat and lower intensity exercise or movements burn a higher, higher percentage of fat calories, then why wouldn't we want to do more lower intensity workouts? Well, the higher your intensity of workout is, the higher the amount of overall calories goes as well. So the higher your heart rate goes, the more overall calories you burn. Also, the higher the intensity of your workout, the longer you will continue to burn calories after your workout is complete. A really great resource for this is a chart I learned about in my ACE training manual that shows the percentage of carbohydrates or fats burned as the primary fuel source based on your respiratory exchange ratio or RER. So your RER is the amount of carbon dioxide produced by your body versus or oh, divided by the oxygen consumed by your body. I'll put it up on the screen. Um, at rest, 
your RER values are approximately 0.75, which indicates that your body is burning approximately 85% fat calories and 15% carbohydrate calories for fuel. As exercise intensity gets harder, your RER increases and the percentage of carbohydrate calories increases while your fat calorie percentages decreases. But your total overall calories increases, so you're burning more total calories in fat and carbohydrates. Here's an example. Um, an individual did 30 minutes of low intensity walking on a treadmill, which burned a total of 240 calories. During that time, their RER was at 0.88, meaning that 41% of their calories burned were fat calories, and 59% of those calories were carbohydrate calories. This means they burned a total of 96 fat calories and 144 carbohydrate calories. Now this individual also did a separate um, 30 minute high intensity training session, which was running instead of walking, where their RER was at 0.93. Here they burned a total of 450 calories, but the percentage of fat calories burned was only 24% and the carbohydrate calories was at 76%. This means they burned 108 fat calories total and 342 carbohydrate calories total in that time period. So you can see that even though the percentages change, overall your total calories go up and even though you had a lower percentage of fat calories, your overall fat calories burned still increased. Um, hopefully this gets the point across that your overall calories will increase with the higher heart rate and even though the percentages change and the percentage of fat calories goes down, your overall fat calories are going to increase because your overall calories are increasing. So let me know if that doesn't make sense. It's, it takes some time to kind of wrap your head around that because I know it took me a while, but it, it does add up to where you are burning more fat calories and more carbohydrate calories the higher your workout intensity goes. So I don't know. I think that's quite fascinating. I know oh, we've, I'll put this up on the screen too. We've talked, I think in every single episode about the um, hierarchy of nutrition and hierarchy of fat loss and discussing why it's more important to focus on your nutrition and your resistance training versus cardio. But this is another reason why myself and many other people in the fitness industry urge you to consider thinking kind of backwards about the societal norms of eating less and doing more cardio because the weight training or the interval training, the resistance training and eating more um, will help you burn more fat and change your body composition much better than burning um, cardio from calories. And oh, gosh, I hear it. I hear it all the time, literally a couple times a week from people that I talk to about what works for them and what doesn't. And I so often hear, oh, cardio is the only thing that works for me. Okay. Have you actually tried anything else or is cardio the only thing that you've done? And when you've stopped doing the cardio, have you gained the weight back? Yeah. There's nobody saying that cardio is not effective. Cardiovascular health is really important. You should do some cardio in some form, um, but cardiovascular health and maintaining that doesn't mean that you have to do cardio necessarily to affect your cardiovascular health. You can get your heart rate up in other ways. So it's just, just something to consider. It's important to eat your carbs. It's important to eat them when. It's important to eat them pre and post workout. I mean, throughout the day too, but probably your biggest times that you want to focus on eating carbs pre and post workout. Um, I personally like to harp on my clients getting to have enough protein post workout, um, though it is important to have carbohydrates post workout as well. So with carbs being your main energy fuel source for your workouts, you're burning up muscle glycogen during your workouts and you need to replenish that storage when you are finished. Um, I think it's easier for me to harp on protein because a lot of people that I work with, for the most part, it's, it's easier for them, or I guess it's just not as common. It's not the norm for them to focus on protein and it's more normal for them to focus on carbs anyway. They may be getting the right amount of carbs and it may be fine. They may not have anything to change, but usually carbs is more of a general focus for people before they recognize how much protein they actually need to have. Anyway, we'll, we'll keep the topic to carbs today because we've already touched on protein. <clears throat> so 
do you think of carbohydrates as good for you or bad for you? And are there different types? So yes, there are different types, but it also depends on how you view them um, based on what your short and long-term goals are when it comes to determining whether or not a specific type of carbohydrate should be labeled good or bad. So let's answer another question. Where do your carbohydrates go once you eat them? Well, they end up in your bloodstream as glucose or blood sugar. But since not all carbs are created equal, let's discuss how your body utilizes carbs in different ways um, and the different types. So we'll start with simple versus complex. And I know you guys have heard that before. So simple carbohydrates consist of a single sugar molecule called a monosaccharide or a double sugar molecule called a disaccharide. Don't worry, I'm going to keep the science pretty simple here because I'm not a biology person. I've gotten this stuff over and over in training and in high school and in college and some of it just doesn't stick. So we're going to keep it really simple because I need to keep it simple for me. So there are three types of monosaccharides or single sugars and those are fructose, glucose, and galactose. Seeing these three words on nutrition labels does not constitute a quote unquote bad carb. Please remember that. Fructose is the type of sugar that you will find naturally occurring in fruit. So remember, fruit, fructose, FF. Disaccharides now are, or double sugars, they're things like sucrose or table sugar, which is a combination of fructose and glucose. So you had, so fructose and glucose are each single sugar monosaccharides, and those combined create a disaccharide, so sucrose. Um, lactose is another type of sugar, so it's another disaccharide, and that is the sugar found in dairy products. So if you are lactose intolerant, then your body has concerns with digesting this particular type of disaccharide sugar. Lactose is a combination of the monosaccharide glucose and the monosaccharide galactose. So why are they called simple? Well, it's simple for your body to digest them, referring to speed. So they are faster digesting and cause a rapid rise in blood sugar, especially when you eat a lot of them by themselves or in meals without fibrous carbs or fats or proteins, which honestly doesn't happen very often unless you really plan for that. Um, so when do you eat a lot of simple, when you do eat a lot of simple carbs very quickly by themselves, you get a spike in blood sugar. And with that, you have a large release of insulin from your pancreas. The insulin clears the blood sugar from the bloodstream, which um, it leads into a blood sugar low, which is known as hypoglycemia. Now, some of the symptoms associated with hypoglycemia are low energy, shakiness, weakness, mood swings, and hunger, which then you know, leads you back into more cravings of sugar and thus a yo-yo effect with sugar binges. Um, and, and I don't want to say binge as in you have a binging disorder, just binge-like symptoms where you go a little crazy, little ham on them, sugars, maybe a couple extra bags of Skittles or Sour Patch Kids, you know, you might want to keep that in check. So <laughs> many people assume and mainly assume because it's what the media puts out there that simple carbs like white sugar, white flour, white potatoes, etc., are bad carbs that cause those blood sugar spikes and crashes. They come with all the calories and no nutrients, so on and so forth. I personally believe you don't need to fear all of these things. This being said, you should consider, again, your overall goals, make sure you hit your daily fiber goal, and stay within your daily calorie and macronutrient goals, which we will get to in a little bit. But having some of these simple white carbs in moderation is going to be okay. It, it is. It's going to be fine. Unless you have a medical condition or reason that you should not have them, everything in moderation is going to be okay. All right. So why then do we cringe when we see some of these words like fructose on nutrition labels? 
Like why is there such a negative connotation to the word fructose? So fructose, as we mentioned earlier, is, an, is naturally found in fruit. So why is it a bad thing? Well, we need to differentiate between fructose, the simple sugar, the monosaccharide found naturally in fruit from the highly processed high fructose corn syrup that is not naturally found in anything, yet found on many, many nutrition labels in stores for refined sugar snacks and drinks. So the biggest difference between these two is that fructose is generally low calorie and high nutrient dense. Oops, and that's my alarm to record this training. <laughs> I was a little ahead of the game this morning. Okay, where were we? Um, oh yeah, the biggest difference between the two of them. So low calorie, high nutrient dense for fructose, but high fructose corn syrup, quite the opposite, high calorie, low or no nutrients really. Um, fructose, unlike other simple carbs, is processed a little differently in our bodies as well, which is why many people attribute fructose and not simply high fructose corn syrup to fat gain and obesity. So we want carbohydrates as our main energy fuel source for our workouts and to restore muscle glycogen levels post-workout. The difference with fructose is that our bodies preferentially restore liver glycogen instead of muscle glycogen with it. And our liver can only store about 50 grams of fructose daily, and then any extra will be converted, or it can be converted into fatty acids. So in general, I mean, a piece of fruit or like one serving of fruit has about five to 10 grams of fructose in it. So you can see it would take quite a few servings of fruit, you know, four, maybe four to six servings for your body to really surpass those limits and convert the excess fructose into fat. But think about a bag of candy or a soda that contains 30 to 50 grams of sugar. I mean, the majority of those sugar carbs in each serving being fructose or sucrose, and sucrose is um, another type of sugar that is 50% fructose. So again, it's more fructose. You can see how quickly you will easily go over that amount of fructose that your liver can handle and properly process. Again, um, there's always going to be a caveat. You do you. And you're going to know, you need to know your somatotype or your body type and how well your body handles these things. There are some ectomorphs. And if you don't know these terms, then pause the video, go back and watch my somatotype video, and then come back so that you understand the different body types and how I'm referring to them. But there are some ectomorphs that can drink soda all day long and not gain a pound, not to say this is healthy, um, but there's also on the opposite end some endomorphs that could have one soda a week and gain weight. And not to say that that's a, not healthy either, but those are extremes. The point here is that everyone is different and so what is quote unquote healthy for one person can be very different for the next person. Now, what evidence then is there that fruit can help with fat loss? since we just talked about how we have kind of a limited amount of storage for uh, fructose and fruit in our liver. Quick water break. Okay, why is fruit always found in the dietary guidelines? I mean, you know, whether it's a food pyramid or you know, my plate where you see the different portion sizes and what you're supposed to have on your plate, um, there's always fruit there, so why is that? The bottom line is that, there's, I feel like I say the bottom line a lot. Um, the bottom line is that whole fruit contains micronutrients. So your vitamins and your minerals, your H2O, it's got health promoting properties, all right? So fruit also, and I've said this before, contains fibrous carbs in addition to just the fructose that's in there. And as we know from our previous fiber training, fiber helps to increase your feeling of fullness. Um, I'll go ahead and put a list of fruits containing fiber here on the screen. And if nothing else, if you get nothing else out of this training, start to include more of these types of fruits in your daily nutrition intake, and maybe a little less of something that you know is more processed. Um, so during my first season of bodybuilding, this is kind of a personal example here, 
my coach cut out fruits from my meal plan, probably about four to six weeks out from my shows. And this was when I was on like a six meal a day, quote unquote, clean, healthy eating. You know, I had very, it was very restrictive. Like there was only a certain amount of foods that I was eating. I didn't know any different at the time, but um, this coach had also cut out even some of my vegetables that were higher in sugar, like peppers. Um, I followed my orders. I did well, but let me tell you, I was miserable and I'm by no means upset at this coach or the methods. I mean, I firmly believe this was how they were trained and it worked for them. So it should work for everyone else too, is kind of the type of thought process. Um, but it's, it was just looking back. It's, I mean, I hope that people are starting to realize that fruits and vegetables, even if they have a little bit of sugar in them are not something that you need to cut out. So I don't know, this is a common misconception that I think, I think is trending in the opposite direction, at least in the bodybuilding world. Thank goodness. Uh, because while these, while some of these methods, they work as far as fat loss goes, there are other methods that are just as effective and not as drastically miserable and restrictive. So I'm happy. I'm so beyond happy to report that my second season of bodybuilding competition utilized a flexible dieting method and I kept fruit in for the entirety of my prep, though I did limit to fruits that were higher in fiber like raspberries, blackberries, and strawberries. And honestly, I was leaner and I kept more muscle mass this season than I did in my previous season. And I enjoyed my nutrition and the overall lifestyle just so much more. So kind of the lesson there is there are lots of different methods out there that work, but there are some methods that are more optimal than others. So is it necessary to put yourself through something that makes you miserable when there's a better way to do it? I mean, you do you figure it out on your own. Sometimes you got to test a bunch of different methods to see for yourself, but I've been there, done that, and I can tell you I won't go back to doing it the original way because I found a better way. So moving on, let's dive into lactose tolerance or intolerance and some dairy products. Actually, quick water break again. I get super thirsty when I'm talking a lot, so everybody else take a water break too. Try to get a, about a gallon a day. So I've got my gallon jug right here with me. Okay. So dairy contains all three different macronutrients. So your fats, your carbs, and your protein. But concerning carbs, the sugar in milk and other dairy products is called lactose. Now, are there some dairy products that are more fattening than others? Well, it depends. <laughs> There are some dairy products that are full fat or partial fat or skim to non-fat, but they're all going to have some carbs. I don't think I've ever seen a carb-free dairy product. I mean, maybe some cheeses, but not, not as far as milk goes. Um, I could be wrong. I don't know, but I haven't seen any. Um, anyway, there's nothing inherently wrong with any dairy product, but some people tolerate the lactose sugar in dairy products better than others with regard to their ability to digest. I'm again, a firm believer that you don't need to cut a certain type of food out of your nutrition unless for medical reasons that you need to do so. So, I mean, a lot of bodybuilders and others on extreme diets will completely eliminate dairy from their diets because they believe that cutting out the simple sugars will help to reduce body fat and get rid of bloating and puffiness. I don't know of any research specifically on this topic, so if you do know of any, please send me the link. I would love to read it. But what I can do is share with you my personal experiences. So this past season, personal experience, I kept dairy in. Um, I had Starbucks probably almost every day in my last prep season. Um, the entirety of the season, which was about six months worth of dieting. And I placed better than I ever had before. I was became nationally qualified. I was leaner than ever before. Um, and I enjoyed my nutrition and my lifestyle a whole lot more. I'm telling you, my family enjoyed being around me more. My friends enjoyed being around me more. My coworkers enjoyed being around me more. I was more productive. Anyway, so what did I reduce then when it came to dairy? Um, over the course of that six months was I went from, 
I maybe I started off drinking grande size drinks and then I went down to tall size drinks and then at the very end I went down to drinking some skinny drinks and then maybe some Americanos that had a little bit of flavor but when I did lessen my dairy intake it wasn't because I wanted to specifically lessen dairy it was because my overall carbohydrate intake was being lowered strategically and so I was aiming to find more nutrient dense voluminous carbohydrate sources to keep me full for a longer period of time now if you're not in a contest prep or losing fat or weight for a specific end date reason to reach whatever goal you have and you're not lactose intolerant i don't think you should fret about this i also don't think that if you have been in a caloric deficit for a sustained period of time maybe two to four months and you have cut out dairy for whatever reason that you should add it back in every day and accept expects your body to accept and digest the lactose as if it had been digesting it all along and maybe i should rephrase that like say you've been in a contest prep or say you've been dieting for a really long period of time and you've completely cut out dairy or lactose ingredients for like three or four months don't immediately add it back in like the week before your show or the week before a photo shoot because you are listening to this training and you're saying, oh, well, it's fine. I can have it. That's, that's going to cause problems <laughs> because your body's not used to it. So my suggestion there, if you want to start adding it back in is do it slowly. Maybe add in one to two dairy items per week for a couple weeks and get your body used to digesting it again. And it might take a few days or a week or so for your body to adjust having that dairy again, maybe longer, just depending. But if you aren't certain whether you are lactose intolerant or not, see if you're experiencing um, these symptoms. And if you are, then I would bring it to the attention of your doctor or your registered dietitian and see if you can get that intolerance verified. So these are the symptoms, um, gassy, bloating, abdominal cramps, diarrhea with certain dairy products. And um, lactate can assist you if your tolerance intolerance is minor. So something, again, to consider. I don't have a dairy intolerance, so I really can't speak to that other than what I've learned about it. Um, but if you do have a dairy intolerance and you have anything, maybe a personal experience you can share with us, then um, comment that below. Let, let us know. Um, let's see, okay. So moving on from dairy to fibrous carbs versus starchy carbs. So we've kind of done simple carbs. Now we're going to work on fibers and starchy or more of the complex carbs. So with simple carbs, we were talking about monosaccharide sugars and disaccharide sugars. And now we are dealing with polysaccharides. A majority of complex carbs contain fiber, which allows for longer sustained energy without the crash that you would get from simple carbs. Complex carbs keep you full for a longer period of time. And usually when referring to complex carbohydrates, we are talking about whole grains, starchy, and fibrous vegetables. So plants store energy in the form of starch. And here is a list of starchy carbs which includes the following, but is not limited to. Potatoes, yams, cereals, grains, bread, pasta, rice, oats, wheat, legumes, and beans. So a big difference between starches and fiber as far as your body's digestive system is concerned is that your body can digest and absorb all of the nutrients in starches, which are also more calorically dense than fibrous carbs. The fibrous portion of the plant is indigestible, so why do you want this? Well, for one, fiber gives bulk to the contents in your intestinal tract, promoting healthy digestion and eliminating waste from the body. So fiber also speeds up the time it takes for food to get through your digestive system and protects you from gastrointestinal diseases and colon cancer. So this is a big reason 
why many people like to do vegetable juice cleanses they or fruit juice cleanses but veggies too um, they believe that these veggies are going to simply clean out their system and give them a fresh start what you don't realize is that even a high amount of nutrients you might get from these pressed fruit and veggie juices doesn't provide you with the same benefits you get from eating and digesting the fiber that you only receive from actually having to chew and digest food. I mean, think about it. How much energy does it actually take to digest the liquid form juice? I mean, not much. Versus how much energy does it take, does it take to chew and swallow and break down your fibrous and starchy vegetables? A whole lot more. This is not to say that the juices are bad, just that you should understand what benefits they do and don't provide to your body. So then how much fiber should you try to get every day if maybe you're not getting that fiber from these juice cleanses? <laughs> well, I've read in several places to include my ACE training manual and the book Burn the Fat, Feed the Muscle, and a couple other places that they reference um, researchers at the University of Kentucky, journal nutrition reviews, an average daily recommended intake for fiber should be approximately 14 grams per 1,000 calories you intake. For most of us, this is going to be 25 to 35 grams per day. This number is a little different per person. It takes a little bit of trial, trial and error for you to figure out, but um, too little fiber in your daily intake and you're not going to have enough movement in your digestive system um, and then too much and you're going to be blocked up for a lack of better terminology. So find your fibers happy place people. <laughs> so why and how then does fiber help with fat loss? I mean you can kind of guess a little bit. I've mentioned some of the things up above but fibrous veggies take a lot more time to chew and swallow. I mean, they simply force you to take more time to eat and fill up your stomach while slowly um, slowing down uh, your gastric emptying process. So they're also full of nutrients, but low in calories. And in 2005, the Institute of Medicine determined fiber to have 1.5 to 2.5 calories per gram compared to the normal four calories per gram for other carbs and their calorie worth. Um, I mean, so you've heard me preach, you know, nine calories per one gram of fat, four calories per one gram of carbs and protein. Um, so why am I now throwing this out there to you that fibrous carbs have a different calorie per gram worth? It's just a fact, but don't, it's not something that I think you need to concern. Like, I don't think you should change your methods of tracking. I don't think you should track it as a separate macronutrient. I think it's just good informational food for thought. I don't think it's necessary to get so specific and track them at a different amount of grams per calorie than other carbs, but I do like for my clients to track fibers, veggies as carbs and to be aware of their fiber intake. I do the same for myself. So do me a favor here. Um, it's a little experiment. Pause this video go into your kitchen or, or do this for dinner tonight, make some sort of starchy carb and some sort of fibrous carb to go along with your lean protein for dinner. I want you to measure yourself out an equal portion of each type of carb and then look at the nutrition facts for the particular serving size. If you have not done this before, you may be shocked to find the higher calorie amount per starchy carb and lower calorie amount per fibrous carb. I mean, in some brands, like an entire bag of lettuce can be a single serving, which is only about five grams of carbs and maybe like one or two grams of fiber. Um, but can you imagine sitting down and eating an entire bag of lettuce? No, it's ridiculous. <laughs> you get so bloated. Um, I mean, some, some of us do that when we are really low carb, really low calorie, but for the most part, you're not going to sit down and eat an entire bag of lettuce. Um, but yeah, like compare, compare like in weight or just compare in like two cups of lettuce versus two cups of rice. Like your mind will be blown. It's ridiculous. <laughs> 
So that's not to say that's one's better or worse than the other. They're just different. And you just have to understand that they're different so that you can better understand how you want to feel your body. So uh, I guess side note here, do you ever wonder why people can still gain weight when they're eating all these big healthy salads? <sighs> it's not the top, it's in the toppings. It's, it's the toppings and the dressings, you guys. It's not the actual like vegetables. It's not the salad. It's not the cucumber. It's not the tomato. It's not the peppers. It's not the corn. It's not the black beans. It's, <laughs> it's, it's when you put things like candied pecans and, you know, like two to three or four tablespoons of ranch dressing or blue cheese dressing or an oil. And that's not to say that these things are bad, but you've got to understand that one tablespoon of oil, like vegetable oil, whether it's coconut oil or olive oil, that's 14 grams of fat, y'all. Again, not an unhealthy source of fat, just a lot of it. So just keep that in mind. Like when you, when you see somebody who grabs a steak and a baked potato versus your salad that's just overloaded with blue cheese dressing, like you probably have more fat in your salad than that person does on their steak, or it's pretty even. I mean, I don't know, food for thought. So when most of us think of fibrous carbs, we aren't referring to the starchy or sugar carbs that additionally contain fiber, but we are referring to the leafy green vegetables like broccoli, asparagus, salad greens, spinach, cauliflower, Brussels sprouts, you get the picture. So here is a quick list of starchy carbs and fibrous carbs. Feel free to pause the video and write these down so that you remember them better. Now I want to quickly touch on the glycemic index scale. I think this can be important for those who are diabetic. I don't believe it needs to be a main focus or point of concern if you are focused on everything else we have discussed thus far about carbs though. Basically the glycemic index or GI scale is where every different type of carb is given a number between one and 100. The lower the number on the scale, the, lower, the slower the carbs are converted into blood sugar, and the higher the number on the scale, the faster your carbs are converted into blood sugar. There are simple and complex carbohydrates that are low, medium, and high on the glycemic index. So the piece I find interesting about the creation of the GI scale is that it was developed based on the effects of eating 50 grams of carbohydrate source from a fasted state. Let's be real, we do not have 50 grams of carbs without protein or fat from a fasted state daily. So this really leaves a lot of room for error in my opinion. Now a great tool for sure, but take the numbers and how they affect you with a grain of salt. This I explained so that you won't think that eating a specific carbohydrate will lead to better fat loss. Is there a correlation? Yes. Is it a direct cause? I couldn't say for sure because there are just way too many other factors to consider, but I don't think by itself it's a direct cause. Now we've talked about a ton of different carbohydrate types thus far, and they have all been really, I guess, quote unquote, good. So what then is considered a bad carb? Can you guess? It's the same concept we spoke about with concern to fat and protein intake. So natural versus processed or refined is where the line is drawn in the sand for good versus bad. To put simply, ask yourself some of these questions. Where did your food come from? Does it still look like the product it started as originally? Is the word refined on the nutrition label? Is it processed in some way, shape, or form? The more processing a carbohydrate or any food goes through allows a flavor to become more enhanced and not natural and allows for the item to last longer on the shelf. When your foods have more nutrients, your body gets more benefit out of them. I firmly believe that the majority of your foods should be whole natural foods. 
But I also firmly believe that if you completely cut out the fun celebratory foods, then you will crave them and eventually it leads to a sitting or two or three of overeating. This is one reason you hear so many people discuss the 80-20 rule where 80% foods should be clean foods, whole, natural, non-refined, or um, oh, and 20% like fun junk foods that are higher in calories, lower in nutrients. Personally, this is why I enjoy flexible dieting or flexible nutrition. I enjoy hitting my protein, fat, and fiber goals and then focusing on nutrient-dense carbs to fuel my workouts. Um, and then I enjoy fitting in some fun foods here and there without going over my macronutrient or calorie goals and not feeling guilty about having something a little out of the ordinary. Other than the obvious junk foods and packaged foods, where might you see a lot of these refined and hidden sugar calories? Well, you might find them in foods labeled non-fat, because if a fat has been taken out, then there's a high chance that sugar has probably been added in to compensate for some flavor. Now you might find them in sauces like steak sauces, tomato sauces, different deli meats, condiments, soups, canned fruits or vegetables, breads, cereals, protein bars, energy bars. You have to read the nutrition labels to really understand what's in the food you're purchasing um, to put into your body or your family's bodies. Now I get the question quite often. Oh, quick water break, sorry. Throat's getting dry. Okay, the question, how much sugar should I eat per day? Should I worry about my sugar intake? The answer is yes and no. So first, my question to you is, are you tracking what you eat currently? Which I feel like is my question to everybody that says, oh, I need nutrition advice. Like, what should I eat? And I say, well, what are you eating currently? So do you have any idea how many carbs and specifically different types of carbs you are eating compared to your total daily calorie levels? If you don't, then I suggest you start tracking for a minimum of five to seven days to include a weekend and hopefully consistently about 14 days to get a solid baseline for your food in intake. And then we can go back and look from there. So I tell my clients that as long as they're hitting their fiber goal for the day, then they can meet the rest of their carbohydrate goal with a combination of starches and sugars, but there's no specific set amount per each starch or sugar. Now the American Heart Association suggests that men um, should have a daily intake of no more than 150 grams of added sugars, and women should limit themselves to 100 grams of added sugar. Let me repeat here, added sugars. So not the naturally occurring sugars that come in your fruits and vegetables and grains and dairy. Now, how do you know whether there are refined sugars in the foods you are eating? Look for these words on the nutrition label and the ingredient list. High fructose corn syrup, corn syrup, rice syrup, glucose syrup, sucrose, dextrose, brown sugar, turbinado sugar, invert sugar. Ingredients on nutrition labels are written in order of primacy within the item. If these names, and, and these are not the only things that you can find, but this is a, a good chunk of the big ones. If you see these names that are the first couple ingredients listed on the nutrition label, then this is a type of food you might want to consider limiting in your daily nutrition. Now, just because an item is whole and natural and quote unquote healthy, does not mean it is a low calorie item. Honey or molasses or agave nectar or maple syrup are extremely high in sugar. Just, just look at the label for a serving size, don't let me spoil it for you. But you can find lots of like 100 calorie snacks, um, 
like snack packs, breads in stores, like you, I mean, just go down the snack aisle. There are so many things that are labeled low calorie, non-fat, sugar-free, whatever the case may be. Um, so there's just, there's tons of stuff out there that are just whole natural things that are super high in calories. And then there's lots of processed foods out there that are low in calories. So just keep these things in mind and keep your goals in mind. And then you can figure out what items fit your goals. You know, everyone's different again, and it's possible to lose weight eating some processed foods, while it's also possible to gain weight eating natural nutrient dense foods. So at this point, I kind of feel like I'm repeating myself a little bit. Um, but I suppose the next and perhaps the big, the last big question for today's training is how many carbs should you eat per day? So traditionally, many calculators, books, and organizations are going to tell you to intake um, anywhere from like 45 to 60 or 65 percent of your calories from carbs, which is a pretty wide variety. Um, burn the fat, feed the muscle recommends about 50 to 55 percent, just depending. But I'm I'm begging you guys. I'm just simply begging you. If you have never tracked, bite the bullet. Dedicate yourself to tracking for one to two weeks because if you go to these calculations that tell you how much you should be eating, there's a really good possibility that the amount of calories and macronutrients recommended for you are a lot higher or a lot lower than what you are currently eating. And by making a drastic adjustment so quickly, you are going to either lose a lot of weight really fast or faster than you intended, which if your goal to maintain is to maintain or gain, then you definitely don't want to lose, or you may gain weight, which might not be your goal either. So if you do track consistently and find you're eating way less than what is recommended for you, then perhaps you should look into a reverse diet, which is a whole nother training entirely. But let me know if that is something you're interested in, or please feel free to share your experience below if this is something you have done. Um, currently I'm going through a reverse diet and this is my second official reverse dieting phase where I'm slowly increasing calories in the proper proportions of macronutrients over time. Um, that's the gist of it. But what else? If you're on a ketogenic lifestyle, then your carbohydrate intake should typically be less than 5% of your daily calories. 70% of your calories should be coming from um, fat approximately, and then 25% or less should be coming from protein. So let's kind of summarize here. I know we've been through a lot of information. So carbohydrates are a ton of fun. They're a ton of energy. Please don't fear them. Hopefully after this training, you will have gained a new respect and understanding for them moving forward on your fitness and nutrition journey. So this is kind of what we went over today. We touched on eating whole, natural, unprocessed carbohydrates, and reducing the processed flours and sugars. The difference between sugar carbs, so it might be some fruit and dairy versus starchy carbs and fibrous carbs. Um, either eating fruits or fibrous carbs with a majority of your meals and snacks. Aiming for about 25 to 35 grams of fiber per day, depending on your calorie intake, so approximately 14 grams per 1,000 calories that you eat per day. I want you to focus on your protein and fat goal, but a good starting point for carbs is about 50 to 55% of total calories. Um, and then fuel your workouts pre and post with a whole natural source of carbs. So, Y'all, thank you so much for listening and watching this training on carbohydrates. Um, please leave me some feedback on what was most valuable for you and what you learned today. Um, any other questions you may have concerning carbohydrates specific to you um, and your personal nutrition and goals, please leave those below or send me an email. Um, if you don't have my email already, it's D-A-N-Y-E-O-M-A-H-O-N-E-Y 42 at gmail.com. But other than that, I certainly hope you guys found this really helpful and that you learned something today and that you can go out and apply it to um, your daily nutrition intake because unlike fitness, nutrition is something that you literally have to do like 
every day. I mean, you don't get an off day from eating unless you're doing some sort of crazy fasting. So you got to eat. So you may as well focus on it, right? Okay. Anyway, that's all I have for you guys today. Have an awesome evening, morning, day, afternoon, whatever. I don't know what time you're watching this. So I will talk to you guys soon. Have a good one and I will see you next time. Bye. Be empowered to make a change in your life and take the next step on your health and fitness journey.